1968, my, my grandmother passed and my mother moved to Houston. Her twin sister was here. And I moved into Acres home and Reverend Williams sent me out here to Good Hope right down the street there on Wilson and Salonier to help Reverend Kimball. In 1977, I would go over to Allen Parkway and get those kids and, and, and Good Hope had a basement. We used to get them clean and wash their face, plait their hair, and give them breakfast and teach them and give them Sunday, give them, teach them Sunday school. And they liked it because we always had something sweet for them. And I'd march those kids from Allen Parkway over here, get them dressed. They'd be sleepy. I'd wake them up, <laughs> get them dressed. And after a while, the parents start coming. Parents start coming and, and uh, some, some, I see some now, they're in their 30s now, and I see some now, they say, you, you still, Rev. Jones, you still, we love people? I say, we love people. That's always been our motto, we love people. We love everybody. And, uh, and I've always tried to look out for the children, <clears throat> the ones that can't look out for themselves, that's Bible, and the elderly. And those that can, that had your strength that they can make it, well, they can make it, but the children, they need guidance. And so you want to, I wanted to make sure they had good guidance. And, and I've been more than just a pastor of this church. I've tried to be a community pastor, the whole community, that we can affect the whole community and meet the needs in the community. Of course, that's the Founders Cemetery. They uh, put it over here near us. Uh, this used to be, of course, you know, used to be swamp land and stuff, but they cleared it out, and uh, Freedman Town was born. And I'm glad that we have a historical landmark in Houston, Freedman Town. Black folks, that black folks contributed something. For, to the history of Houston. I'm glad about that. I'm glad about that. 1836, when uh, the Allen brothers founded Houston, black folks contributed something to the foundation of Houston. And I'm glad about that. Uh, Freedman Town meant a lot. And as you know, we had, our community was self-sufficient. We had wash interiors, laundry mats, we had grocery stores, all of that back in the 60s and the 50s. We had uh, movie theaters. We had uh, right on the, on the corner of Valentine and, and Dallas, there, there was a, a drug store and a little duplex there, right on the corner down there. And, I think it was P and P Drugstore, E and P Drugstore down there on the corner, the movie theater down there. The church was vibrant in the sixties. Even when I came out in the seventies, we the one good thing about Fourth Ward, we didn't drive a lot of places like we do now. I I'd get in my truck and drive down the street to a place, but we walked everywhere we went. We walked. We talked, and we just communed and fellowshiped, and the community was vibrant. And the elders back then had a hand on and control of all of the, the young people coming up. We all had the same morals and principles. We respected our elders. That was a, that was a cornerstone. We respected our elders. We was obedient. As, uh, to our parents. Now we, we wasn't perfect. We did some things that we had no business, but that's all. We were children coming up. But those principles, respect your elders. Yes ma'am, no ma'am, thank you ma'am. May I and can I, you know, those things there that, that, that strengthens our community, that give respect to the community. Uh, it was rich and refreshing to just walk down the street and see Mama Sarah on the porch and say, good morning, Mama Sarah. You remember Mama Sarah, I believe you. She, she, was, she stayed here until she passed. She, she used to live right behind us there. Row, 10 row houses was in, in, 
in this all the way down to the end of the block. Mama Sarah lived there. Uh, several other the elderly lived on that. They would sit on their porch and we would wave and sometimes stop and talk to them uh, just to gather some wisdom as a young person. And you know what they taught me, my sister? They taught me to don't, don't rely on somebody else to do what I can do. To do what I can do uh, and as a young person to put something back in our community. Uh, this is what I mean. Uh, for one thing, to save your money, to try to, the little money we made, to save some and to put some back in the community. Uh, it was all, it wasn't about selfishness back then, it was about community. Uh, we all think, thought of one another. We didn't think just of ourselves. Went to the store, we got sugar, we got sugar for Mama uh, Wright, uh, we got sugar for somebody else, we got rice. Everybody shared, and I like that. Uh, that's a lost art of people caring and sharing. I love the idea of, of sharing with others. I uh, don't just get enough for myself. I got other people around me. We are the fam the, the community is a family. In fact, most of the people out here, when I came out in 77, they were kin. The Burrs was kin to the Banks, and the Banks was kin to the Smiths, because they in a marriage, you know, they married into each other's family, and that's why the police department, my sister, you're going to laugh about this, the police department, um, they would come out in crowds, they three or four cars, because when they tried to arrest somebody, whether they were selling crack or doing crack, uh, they would throw them on the ground and then the whole, the community would come around. And so they would be afraid and they'd say, well, 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 we got to do something about all of the people gathering around. So they asked the ministers to be uh, ministers against crime, to be a part of the solution that nothing bad would break out. So what we would do, sometime we would ride with the police officers, and if, if they got caught doing something wrong, we would say, now your child would either get killed or go to, the, or go to prison. Now, I, I'd much rather see him in prison because he'll get out pretty soon, but we don't want to see him dead in the street. And so they would back up and let the police do what they uh, had to do. Because one thing about black folks, they respect they respected the, the, the office of, uh, of, of the preacher, especially if the preacher meant well for the community. Not just anybody that just out for themselves, but if he meant well for them, they, you can tell when a person mean well for you, and you can tell when a person just out for themselves to try to grab everything they can. And so the people respected the church, respected the ministers, and they respected the law when the law was fair. The law wasn't always fair, and as you know, it's not always fair either, even now. But they respected that, and so we were able to get a lot accomplished uh, riding with the police officers, talking to the people, telling them to settle down. We had a, a, a white officer out here. They called him Carl Lewis. He would run. They had a lot of crack in the last part of 80s and 90s. In, in, in 90s, the 90s was really hard. Uh, Carl Lewis, a white cop, would run them down and wrestle them down on the ground and put the handcuffs on them. And all of the people came out and, and they, uh, they, they thought that was excessive, which it was a little excessive. But we said, let him do his job. Let, let them do their job. It was usually two or three of them. It wasn't just one person. When the police came out, they came out in, 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 in volume, you know, they came out two or three or four or five. But uh, we watched what the police did, and we also watched how the conduct of the person that they were arresting. And usually the parents would be out there, the grandparents would be out there, because the community was made up of families. And they all would be around, and, and, and a lot of time we discouraged the people from, like, having a riot or getting mad at the police department and tell them, let them do their job. You can get your son out. Uh, let him go on, on to jail. You can get him out. But that was just a part of 
the ministry out here and a part of being a part of the community family. Uh, when people know that you care, they, they, will, they, will, they will pretty much respect what you say when they know that you care and you really exhibit that. And for the most part, they had redlined our community, but Mayor Lanier took it to another level. He uh, took it off the red line list and he started really being productive by doing something that was nice for our community and, and something that would uplift the lives of the people in our community, the elderly, the young, the youth. They put a, a water park down there in Wiley Park and they, they start sprucing up. They got new streets now. But Mayor Lanier started that, and I was so glad. After he started it, Mayor Brown continued it. Mayor White continued it. But uh, I was glad to, be, glad to be a part of that. And my sister, that was a great change, a gentrification, as you know, in our community. Well, I, I uh, asked the Lord to let me be a part of the change because... I'd rather be a part of the change and have some solutions to the change than just to sit down and change happen and I do nothing. I, I, and he let me be a part of it. I wanted to make sure our streets was like they were, they should be like they are in River Oaks and other areas. I wanted to make sure that they, they uh, did us do justice in this community because for a while there, they thought that Fourth Ward, I, I bought some property out here, and they said, well, Fourth Ward ain't never, never going to be anything. But the Lord saw it different. Yes, Fourth Ward is now the cornerstone to downtown. It's in between downtown and River Oaks. And everybody wants the land now. But back then, they didn't think it was going to be anything. Uh, trees and old trees and weeds and burnt out houses and drugs was all over the community. But God knew better. Look at it now. You, it's prosperity out here now. You're people living in houses. And uh, that was one of the parts of the solution that I was glad to be a part of, those, those starter houses. I just wanted to give some, some of our, want to give some of our black folks a place to stay. And, and some houses that we can, it's in other communities, it's housing that we can participate in. Start a home, three bedrooms, two and a half bath, a brick, a nice little two car garage, a little starter home, 1,400 square feet that you can start your family. And you know how much they, they had, uh, Mayor Lanier said we can only sell those houses for $92,000. Now that was, a, that was amazing. Those houses right across the street there, 92,000. Three bedroom, two and a half bath, kitchen, living room, dining room. Give our people something that they can hold on to. When you invest in a home, you invest in equity. And, and to give somebody, some, our, our people a better life. Yeah, we can catch the boat going down, but we need somebody to lift us up. That's why we named our organization Uplift Fourth Ward, to uplift the community, to, to uplift the, 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 the face of our community. It was being gentrified, but we wanted to hold on to something out here and have a semblance of a black community that have not died and not gone down. We wanted a semblance, and we have some semblance of it in the, some of the old houses, that's one of the houses over there that we fixed up, veterans living in, the senior citizen veterans living in now. But we wanted to keep that, keep a semblance of Fourth Ward. This is a place where black folks thrived, kind of like the place in Oklahoma. It wasn't as elaborate as uh, the Oklahoma, the Wall Street there in Oklahoma, but we had everything we needed. You know, uh, one of the exciting things about fourth ward was we couldn't rent hotel rooms downtown and so they had a trolley coming from Wilson all the way down to the end of the graveyard from downtown coming down Dallas 
dropping people off in Fourth Ward so we can rent rooms. We couldn't rent uh, rooms in a hotel down there, but we could rent. People could come to come to Fourth Ward and rent rooms whenever they had a convention or they had a a, a large setting where people gathered. They would rent rent rooms, uh, fifty cent dollar, two dollars a night. You know, back in the fifties and the forties, and uh, people stayed. They stayed together without uh, all kind of fine fare. They stayed together. They stayed in a rented room. They wasn't afraid the person would uh, take anything from them because we, we as a people, we cared about one another. I don't know whether you can rent a room, a lot of rooms <laughs> today, and, 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 and be safe, but back then you could because people cared about people. And I think uh, we need to keep some of those principles that we were reared on. We, we, used, we tried to take the principles of the other people, and I think that's where we messed up. We didn't keep all of our principles. I got a whipping when I did wrong, and now they say you got to get time out, and they try to send you to jail or put you in jail or send you to court if you whip your child. I think a, a good whipping is good. The Bible says, spare the rod, fall the child. Uh, they don't believe in that now. Uh, but we were reared up with that because what a whipping says is that there's some right things you could do and there's some wrong thing. When you do wrong, there's a consequence. And I was raised up with those principles. And one of the principles that I hold dear now is respect for one another. I respect you. Uh, I respect your work and the quality of work that you do. Uh, I've been knowing you a long time, and, and, and you do a great job in trying to res keep some of the history of Fourth Ward. I know they almost wiped it out. They can't move this cemetery. <laughs> they can't do that. Uh, they can't move some of the things that we have out here. But for the most part, it's, it's just about almost gone. I was, we, were, we did build over 100 of these little houses out here so people have somewhere to stay, but now beside those little houses, there are high rises, $2 million homes, $500,000 homes. But uh, I mean, it, and it's a diverse community now. And I, I'm, I'm for inclusion and diversity, I'm for that. But I don't think you have to erase, you don't have to erase the history of, of what happened what Fourth Ward stand stood for, it stood for people, I still, I believe, people that care about people. And I know when I first started doing this, my sister, they say, oh, Reverend Johnson is, he's a sellout, he's gone. They wrote me up in the newspaper, in the, in the, in the, in the community paper. But when we build those houses and we offered it to low to moderate income, people and say they're only $92,000 and the city going to give you nineteen five. you can move in. Your note won't be, you paying maybe four or $500 rent. You can have a, you can, you live in your own home. You can have a $400 note and living in your own home in equity. And those homes that we sold in 2001, 2002, three, four, they were 92 then. The city gave 19500 to buy down the equity and for all of the closing costs. And those homes right now are selling for 300000 I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's, 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 that's mind-boggling. Uh, Ten-year investment, and you get triple or quadruple your investment on a home. We didn't know what was going to happen, but it happened that way because... And then when you, when a person see where you got weeds and drugs and infestation of all kind of stuff and the community is going down and you see that and you see somebody trying to lift it up, you're going to be talked about and it's all right. I think a person ought to do what's right and what's good no matter what they, people say about them, they still need to keep the principle, I'm going to help people all of my life. I'm going to 
uplift my community. I'm going to love people. I'm going to uh, give myself to the well-being of people, the quality of life for people. I'm going to do that. I don't care what happened. I don't care who talk about you or what. I'm going to do it. And I committed myself to that. And I thank God for that. I was raised like that. I was raised like that. You respect people. You don't hurt nobody. You don't take nothing. Because people forget that there's a God. You know, if you try to get over on people and take from people, God will get you. Yeah, he'll get you. He'll get you. Before you leave here, you're going to have to pay for it. And I don't want to have to pay for a whole lot of stuff before I leave here. I want to leave here, lay my head down and pass away and go on and be with the Lord without laying on my back three or four years suffering because of the things that I did. I want to do what's right. So um, the community started going down in the 80s and the 90s? Yeah, in the 80s. In the early 80s and late 80s, uh, started going down in the 90s. And drugs was everywhere. You know, crack had come out, and and, and uh, uh, it was it was a uh, epidemic. It was infestation of uh, drugs. Just uh, that was the quickest way you can make money, and people gravitate to to uh, quickest way you can make money is if you stand on the corner and you sell your little drug, because the people from River Oaks came and bought it from us uh, out here. Some of the people. Not all of them, but some of them from down, from Memorial and all around, they came out and bought drugs. And so we were heavily into using them. And I don't know, uh, uh, I don't know whether it was, I think about it sometimes. And, uh, and I could develop a, a conspiracy theory, but I, I'm not so quick to do that but I but I, I know it was some design to keep us to keep us uh, under control and to keep us from rising to the height that we could rise I know that uh, people that have influence influence the system and uh, and that's, we couldn't get drugs out here unless people put them out here. And so I, don't, I think that uh, a lot of our communities go down when we have a lot of drugs and, and stuff in our community. But I don't think we orchestrate that. I think other people orchestrate it and we get involved and we, 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 we become caught up in that kind of system. Uh, People wasn't designed to to live like uh, I don't want to say animals, but live like people that that just don't care, and people that harm their families, and and people wasn't designed to live like that, and and I think the nature of man is generally, I believe in man, and I believe that man is good in general. He could be. I know the Bible speaks that we have a sinful nature that we do some things, but I think to add to that, when people put things in our systems to make us crazy, my grandmother, I was reared in the country, and my grandmother said, Art Linkletter's daughter jumped off a building back in the 50s, and my grandmother said that, that them drugs will run you stone crazy, and she was right about that and I was afraid to take them. When I came to Houston, I was in the woods of Louisiana, down, down, down in Natchitoches, down in the country. And I was afraid because I saw even back in the 50s what they would do, hallucinating drugs in, in the early 60s. And so, uh, but when I came to Fourth Ward, we had a lot of that going on out here. Uh, in 84 when I started pastoring. I came out in 77 to help Reverend Kimball. And that's, uh, they were, people were just coming back from Vietnam and they had a, a we were in a, Allen Parkway, we had a lot of Vietnamese. And said, 
uh, was we res was the black folks responsible for what happened to Fourth Ward, or was others responsible for what happened to Fourth Ward? And it came down to my sister, and I sure hate to say that, that we were responsible for what happened to Fourth Ward. It's true. Uh, I don't care what you try to make. Oh, but if you don't own your property, it belongs to somebody else, and they can sell it out for money. You, if you're going to make a difference, you got to buy where you are. I wish I could preach that into these young people today, that if you don't own anything, you, 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 can't, you, you can talk and make all kind of noise, but it belongs to somebody else, and they can sell it out for money. you. The best thing to do is, is ask them, say, can I buy this? I'll pay you uh, 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 40 years if you want me to, but I want to buy it. And you own it, they can't take it from you.